everyone welcome to yet another talk from digra india and today we have our very own dr shobhik mukherjee who is an assistant professor in cultural studies at the center for studies in social sciences calcutta india shobhik's research looks at uh, looks at the narrative and the literary through the emerging discourse of video games as storytelling media and uh, and how and that how these games inform and challenge our conceptions of narratives identity and culture related inter related interests and expertise include a broad spectrum of topics in game studies ranging from identity and temporality in video games to the video game industry in southeast asia currently he is researching how video games relate to post colonial studies and separately also how so also how certain ancient indian board games contribute to the understanding of gameplay shobhik is the author of two monographs video games and storytelling reading games and playing books and video games and post colonialism empire plays back as well as many articles and book chapters in national and international publications his other interests are the digital humanities post structuralist theory post humanism and early modern literature his databases on the dutch cemetery at chinsura the scottish cemetery in kolkata and the 19th century bengali industrialist mutilal seal are all available open access he has also been an advisor on an archive on the play, on the plaques of the presidency project he has been a board member of the digital games research association digra and a founding and a founder member of dharti that is the digital humanities group in india shobhik has been named a digra distinguished scholar in 2019 he is also an affiliated senior research fellow at the center of excellence game studies at the university of tampere with that i would welcome shobhik mukherjee to start his talk so thank you punam for this really generous uh, and long introduction and uh, and also thank you um, everyone for uh, sparing your uh, sunday evening afternoon for some uh to uh, or hopefully not the night but for sunday evening afternoon uh to kind of join us here and also like punam said on behalf of digra india since this is the first official talk that we are uh, having um i'm i'm very fortunate to be able to wish you happy new year on behalf of digra india uh despite despite kind of uh, the way the new year has begun for many of us um so i i'm going to uh, this is a talk which um, i'm kind of uh, quite interested in uh, uh, about a game that i'm very interested in as well and uh, kind of uh, i've uh, given a kind, a kind of version of it at the american association of religion uh, but it was kind of a very small and select kind of uh, group uh, so i wanted to uh, speak to a larger audience uh so i'll get more feedback and uh, maybe uh, try to develop it into um uh, a paper or or kind of uh, something similar so right so i'm kind of uh, going to uh, you know start by explaining my title worshiping banashur uh this paper is not about worshiping uh, well any god or any kind of uh, ashur uh, per se although although in a way perhaps in a way we are always worshiping in different ways uh, but my paper is kind of named uh, thus because of the of a deity that uh, is there in this game far cry 4 uh, anyone who has played far cry 4 will know that this game is set in a fictitious uh, himalayan kingdom called kirat uh, and uh, the reigning deity in this uh, kingdom is called banashur and uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, well the daughter of banashur is kira who's uh, after whom uh, we may get this name kirat uh, you can call her kaira kira uh kairat kirat i don't know how the americans pronounce things uh, so anyway but you can see that uh, there are these uh, buddhist prayer flags as well uh in this kind of screenshot this is not really it's it's a, it's actually a kind of a cover, it's actually cover art for for the far cry 4 game 
one of the earlier cover arts uh, art examples, but uh, it's been changed now. Uh, but yeah, so you can see uh, uh, the antagonist uh, in this pink suit. His name is Pagan Min. He's standing with his head, uh, you know, with his hand on the head of uh, uh, the protagonist, or uh, perhaps just one member of the, you know. Uh, one NPC, but you have you have him standing, uh, sorry, sitting just o- over this person. Uh, so, right. Um, so with that, uh, just just with this ex- explanation, I want to uh, you know this paper is about Far Cry Four and what I call the Ubisoft version of Hinduism and Buddhism. So uh, uh, you can see kind of a mix of uh, Hinduism and Buddhism in this game. I think, and that's what I'll talk about. So first to talk about Banasur. Now, uh, I don't know if anyone here is familiar with Banasur. Anyone at all here familiar with Banasur, uh, who, who this character is, uh, this Banasur character, um, uh, or how, how Banasur kind of uh, figures in, in Hindu mythology? Any, anyone at all? Am I still audible? Yes, yes, absolutely. Great. Anyone knows Banasur at all? Any uh, Anyone can identify the figure of Banasur in this painting? Okay. Well, so Banasur is, um, in Hindu mythology, Banasur uh, is uh, this... Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but it, this uh, character with a thousand arms, you can uh, the, you, uh, up top, you see this uh, character on a chariot, lots of arrows being shot and being shot by him and at him. And uh, this is a rather interesting tale. So Banasur is an Asura and uh, he, is, uh, he is an Asura and uh, like I, I don't want to translate asura to demon because or because that's, it's not exactly the same thing. But Banasur uh, is one of the is is the son of the asura Bali, who who became immortal. But uh, his father Bali uh, was was a very powerful asura who had uh, conquered most of the kingdoms of all the uh, all the gods. Um, and then the gods kind of sent uh, Vishnu as the Vaman avatar to Bali and uh, Bali or Boli in Bangla. And uh, then uh, Bali was a really generous king. Uh, and uh, Vishnu kind of asked a boon of Bali basically and uh, got back the entire uh, king, all the kingdoms of, of the gods and, uh, and much more besides. But it is because of uh, Bali or Boli's generosity that people remember him today. And there are many shrines to, to this Asura uh, king. And he is also one of the immortals, uh, one of the seven immortal figures in Hindu mythology uh, with Hanuman and others, uh, Bhivishan, Pipacharya, so there is Bali. But uh, Bali's son is Banasur, who was also a powerful Asura and he uh, he kind of got a boon from Shiva and he got, had thousand arms and uh, he, he was considered uh, invincible. And uh, there are multiple stories about Banasur. We'll come to these stories in a bit. Um, so uh, one of the things is that he had a beautiful daughter uh, who, who uh, fell in love with Krishna or yeah, Lord Krishna, who's uh, Vishnu's avatar, uh, Lord Krishna's uh, grandson, Aniruddha. And uh, then, uh, but Banasur had locked her up in a, in a fort. But when the two of them, um, uh, they met sec- secretly, the daughter and uh, Krishna's grandson, they may, met secretly. And then they uh, wanted Banasur to bless their marriage. Banasur uh, locked up Aniruddha and uh, uh, Krishna started waging war against the Banasur. So this is, this is the battle that, is, that you're seeing there. And uh, in the battle, you'll see that uh, Lord Shiva is, uh, has sent his son Kartikeya to fight for Banasur. 
anyway, but fi finally Manasur uh, uh, is is kind of like is defeated because Krishna takes out his Sudarshan chakra and then cuts off his arms one by one, and then Manasur goes to Lord Shiva and Shiva intercedes for Manasur in this part of the story, and uh, and then kind of Manasur is allowed to live. But there's a second part to the story. There's a second story where Banasur again becomes very, very arrogant and he gets a boon from the Lord Brahma. And uh, he is uh, kind of told that he will not be, uh, he will be invincible and he can't be killed by anybody except by a virgin uh, girl. And uh, he thinks that's impossible. So he again kind of starts attacking the gods. And at this time, uh, the goddess Shakti appears as Kumari and defeats him. So uh, these are the two stories of Banashur. And this is this, uh, uh, this is a painting from Nepal that uh, kind of shows one of the, you know, one of the, uh, well, uh, one of the tales that, that I've just told you. Now there are many, uh, there are temples to Banashur as well. And as you, as you uh, I'm sure know that, uh, Asuras are worshipped by some communities and some, uh, you know, in in India, not just communities across across the religion. There are temples to Banashur. There are temp and it's also kind of curious because there are temples to Banashur in North India, in Uttarakhand, in Uttaranchal. Um, there, there's also a Banashur dam in near Vayanad in Kerala. So where Banashur's kingdom was or is. Is something that is uh, that is quite curious. Uh, that's that's uh, that's something that we are uh, we we kind of uh, still don't know. So uh, sorry. Uh, so Banashur ka Killa is is uh, supposedly Banashur's fort in Uttaranchal, but then there is the Banashur Sagar Dam in Wayanad in Kerala, and there are also two temples dedicated to Banashur in the states of Odisha at, near Katak, and uh, there is one in Uttar Pradesh. So. There are multiple theories as to where Banasur had his kingdom and the shrines related to his life events are to be found from everywhere from Assam in the east to Kerala in the south. Uh, apparently, Banasur was also uh, kind of, he was also connected to the area that is described uh, as Kirat in Far Cry 4. Uh, as, as kind of, or Kirat, or, or Kirat in Indian mythology, as the first king of Kirat. And in that narrative, the battle between Krishna and Banasur took place in the Terai regions of the Himalayas. Now, Banasur, of course, uh, as most of you here will know, is not a major god in the Hindu religion, really, Hindu pantheon, or uh, many of you will not have known about Banasur. When I asked you, none of, none of you knew who Banasur was or... But in the in Far Cry Four, Banasur is the main god, is the is is actually the father of Kira, after whom Kirat is named, and he is the main god who is worshipped. So he is referenced in in uh, as the he's believed to be the creator of the universe, and uh, there are many places in Far Cry Four, like you see places like Banasur's song, Banasur's Ketra, Banasur's spire, and Banasur's pil pilgrimage, and. Uh, there's also another ca character in uh, in this uh, in Far Cry 4 called Yalung. Yalung is supposedly a demonic entity which who is Banashur's brother and who became jealous of Banashur's power. Uh, he might be a brother or a, or, or a younger deity or a child of Banashur. It's not very clear, but he lives in hate and jealousy and anger and all the negative feelings. And there, are, there, there is a Thanka painting of Yalung, which depicts him with, uh, uh, in what is like three eyes. So apparently there is a story that Banashur and Yalung fought a long battle. In the end, Banashur broke Yalung into pieces and scattered him across the land. So just as Banashur has many places in Kirat named after him, so does Yalung. And the player can play a side quest that involves masks of Yalung, where the player has to find a serial killer. Spoiler alert. But uh, so this is, uh, this is kind of, uh, these are the two stories of uh, Banasur. One, uh, Banasur in, in kind of uh, in Hindu mythology and the other Banasur in the game. And uh, I also need to talk a little bit about Kirat. Kirat is probably, uh, Kirat or Kairat 
K Y R A T is the spelling. It is probably derived from Kirat, which uh, K I R A T, which is which co uh, comprised modern day Nepal and sections of northeastern India. Uh, the Encyclopedia Britannica describes the Kirat people as the earliest inhabitants of the Kathmandu Valley. According to Iman Singh Chemjong, the Kirati people are connected to the Kirat Ashur tribe of Assyrian origin, but archaeological proof of this is scant. In West Sikkim in India, the Kirateshwar temple is dedicated to Shiva because it was apparently at that location that Shiva defeated the Pandav hero Arjun from Mahabharata in the geese in the geese of a kirat hunter a hunter from the kirata tribe so there are no temples of banasur in the area to the best of my knowledge and banasur is not worshipped as a god either in nepal or anywhere in uh, or kind of not as a god anywhere in india but where there are banasur temples uh, in india um so another nepali connection that came into light while researching this paper was this painting that i'm showing you uh, this uh, painting titled the Bhagavad Purana, Purana battle between Manasur and Krishna begins and it is dated to 1775 from Nepal and it was currently being auctioned at, at Christie's in London. So uh, having established some comparisons between Banasur, Yalung, Kirat and their counterparts in Indic mythology, it will be necessary to look at some of the other deities in Far Cry 4's Kirat. The major names that uh, come to mind are Kaira, Kira, the daughter of Banashur, and her living incarnation, the Tarun Matara. Now, uh, anyone who's familiar with Devanagari or you know, or kind of Indian languages, uh, North Indian languages, will know that Tarun um, is equal, means young, and Matara is often a form of Shakti. So, Tarun Matara, however, is a veiled reference to the Kumari of Kathmandu who is considered an incarnation of the goddess Taleju Bhavani. There are also religious landmarks in Far Cry 4, such as uh, the Chal Jama Monastery, where the teachings of Kira were first recorded, and also a temple called the Jalendu Temple. Jalendu means moon in the water, moon of the water, Jal Indu, um, Jalendu. Um, and uh, uh, every year, apparently, um, a young virgin girl is chosen in a ceremony as the Tarun Matara. Uh, in this Jalendu temple. Now, this ceremony of choosing the Tarun Matara is also quite similar to the selection of the Kumari in Kathmandu, uh, the Kumari Puja, which I will be just talking about uh, in a bit. And this Jalendu temple is also itself modeled on the Tal Barahi temple dedicated to the goddess Durga uh, that is built in the middle of the Feva lake in Pokhara. If you've been to Pokhara, the Feva Tal, and this is the, uh, on the right is the is the uh, Tal Barahi Temple, and uh, on the left you see the Jalendu Temple. You can see how similar they are, and in of course uh, in Far Cry Four they had to bust it up a bit. So there are these landmarks um, that, as I've as I just read, read out, where you see this uh, these kind of this temple and. Uh, in Pokhara and the temple in the in the game. Similarly, there is uh, there is the Tarun Mahatara, whom you can see on the left, and uh, the Kumari at Patan, Nepal. But there are also other Kumaris in uh, Nepal who are worshipped as uh, young girls who are worshipped as Kumaris. Even in in the Bengali Durga Puja, also you have the tradition of Kumari Puja. But uh, in of course, the game is very critical of the practice of Kumari Puja because it, uh, it's more uh, quote unquote feminist and uh, progressive ending shows the abolition of the custom of the Tarun Matara. The other more conservative ending, ending has the leader Sabal, um, who is uh, uh, there are two leaders, Am Amita and Sabal. So Amita is the more has the more feminist ending, and uh, uh, she abolishes the Tarun Matara if you support her. But if you support Sabal, then he kills off all the members of the opposing faction. Uh, and reinstates the practice of having the Tarun Matara. Actually, even the so-called progressive ending is rather negative, as the final outcome is that Kirat becomes a drug peddling state. So even Amita, dis despite kind of abolishing the Kumari, uh, you know, the Tarun Matara um, practice, um, uh, turns Nepal into a drug. Sorry, not Nepal, but turns Kirat into a drug peddling state. In Nepal, there while there has been much criticism of the practice. 
uh, there have also been strong voices in defense of the tradition. And as Monica Sarkar reports, uh, Chanira Bajracharya, a 19-year-old Nepali student, was a Kumari of Patan, a city within Kathmandu Valley. Fulfilling the role from age 5 to 15, she says she still looks up to the goddess. I feel I'm blessed and a lot of my success comes from those blessings. She says that the tradition encourages respect for women in a male-dominated society. So you have a very different response to kind of this idea of the Kumari Puja uh, in, in kind of in, you know, by, by one of the people who have been the, uh, uh, you know, the Kumari. Uh, so Bajracharya thinks that uh, the tradition should continue, but ad advocates the proper education of the Kumaris. Uh, the tradition may have its controversies, uh, but uh, any criticism of it needs to be undertaken with care, care and responsibility and not imposed without consulting the local population. But this is, of course, a problem with Far Cry 4, because it has uh, it just decides uh, what is good for uh, in Nepal or maybe South Asia uh, with a decision that, you know, having the Kumari as a practice, uh, Puja as a practice is bad. Um, anyway, returning to the religious practices uh, depicted in the game, there are monks clad in ochre and smeared with ash in the fa fashion of Hindu monks in the Chal Jama monastery. At the same time, um, at the same time, there are also, let me just see if I can show you. Yeah. So at the same time, there are also uh, kind of, uh, uh, well, um, uh, there are uh, Chortens and uh, Tibetan prayer wheels called money wheels in the game uh, and prayer flags that cover the landscape. Animal sacrifice is also depicted uh, in um, kind of uh, in, uh, sorry, um, excuse me. Uh, yeah, animal sacrifice is also depicted inside the Chaljama monastery, something that would be unthinkable inside a Buddhist place of worship given the Buddhist insistence of, on ahimsa and uh, non-violence. So you can see this man uh, standing in front of Banashur with the goat the, and there is already a boar which has been sacrificed. Uh, so um, I'm, I don't know if Hindu said temples actually have boars being sacrificed in there, but uh, that's also another kind of issue to think about. But then uh, I'm quite sure that Buddhist uh, monasteries wouldn't have kind of animal sacrifices um, allowed really in, inside them. Uh, so inside the Chaljama temple, the player prayer protagonist is asked uh, to make his offerings to Banashur and is told that the god sang the world into existence. So one might call this an uncharacteristically logocentric or phonocentric creation story for an Indic religion. Then again, uh, so uh, the patchwork religion is maintained as is created by combining various mythologies, rituals and religious practices from in Indian religions and then reinterpreting it in terms of a Western paradigm is not something completely new. Such practices date back to the early Orientalist discourses of Indic religions. So uh, as, I, as I'm trying to say is that uh, this patchwork, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it in a, a, a little later, uh, uh, I mean, more directly, is almost an hyper real creation, uh, which I'll come to in a bit, but, uh, and I'm saying that this is not new. This this is this is all, all, always been done with with Indian religions, Indic Indian religions, and of course considering Buddhism and Hinduism together, and then kind of just fusing things randomly. And here you see one of the ochre clad monks, monks who just kind of steps out of the Chaljama monastery and um, uh, says a quick namaste to Ajay Ghale or Ajay Ghale, as the Americans pronounce uh, the name of the protagonist. Well, and there's also a huge thing about kind of the use of Hindi in the game. Uh, and there was actually a change.org petition by uh, over a thousand Nepali people who protested against the use of Hindi uh, in a game which was clearly set in Nepal. But uh, of course, uh, again, uh, against that, the developers of the game also claimed that they were not kind of... Uh, uh, they were not creating a Disneyland version of Nepal, but they were creating something that was as true as possible. And they shot three or four, uh, sorry, three documentaries to show how, uh, you know, how close to Nepal their game was, so on. So all of this, 
and notwithstanding, I want to say that, you know, the patchwork of religion that they've created, rather, rather strange pat patchwork in the way they've combined multiple religions and random things from different religions is not new. And it comes from uh, way back uh, is what, uh, in, in what kind of Edward Said uh, defines as Orientalism, where the Orient was almost a European invention had been since antiquity a place of romance, exotic beings, haunting memories, landscapes, and remarkable experiences. Now it was disappearing in a sense it had appeared. Uh, so basically what has happened is the Orient is a creation. Uh, and uh, Said is describing how Chateaubriand and Nerval uh, uh, had looked at uh, the Orient as, as kind of, you know, uh, it through, through kind of an European, kind of a European representation of the Orient as a place of romance and exotic beings. And uh, we have uh, a classic example uh, is the British poet Robert Saudi, who uh, uh, very famously kind of uh, gets a stat to see a statue, which he considers really ugly. And uh, the statue is of Kartikeya, or Kartikeya or Murugan from uh, South India. And uh, he goes to Bristol and the missionary society there he finds the statue, London Missionary Society, uh, they collect statues and bring them back to England. And he sees it and thinks it's really ugly. And uh, <coughs> Saudi uh, has a lot of problems uh, and he writes this with Hinduism and he writes this uh, kind of, um, uh, well, uh, a play uh, kind of a poem, a long poem called The Curse of Kehama, uh, where, uh, uh, he, he kind of uh, seeks not to just depict Brahminical religion as the essence of priestcraft and superstition, but also to show that the popular forms of Hinduism contain implicitly Christian virtues and beliefs, and that majority of Hindus are therefore suited to evangelism. So basically the end of the Kehama is, is how, how kind of the priest is kind of overthrown, the wicked Brahmin priest is overthrown, and how basically after uh, actually the Hindus are like, uh, you know, uh, very Christian in their thinking and they can be converted to Christianity. It's just kind of, they're just waiting to be made Christian. And I, I, I would want you to also think about William Carey uh, and uh, Marshman and Ward and others kind of in uh, Sirampur, always kind of comparing Krishna, Krishna uh, to Christ and, uh, and kind of often, often kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, describing Christ as kind of Krishna and uh, as a better form of Krishna or as a more correct form. So Saudi is, of course, aligning himself with the missionaries who had just started their large scale missionary activity in India, such as the London Missionary Society, and were making and was making assertions such as that the religion of the Hindu does not depend upon himself. It is something independent of his thoughts, words, actions, understanding and volition. And he may be deprived of it by violence as easily as of his wallet. According to Bal Chandra Rajan, for Saudi Hinduism is a terminal ailment. It also suggests that the insidious destructiveness of the ailment lies in the nature of the Hinduism's fabling in the quality of his religious imagination. Here, Hinduism is unlike the religion of the Mexicans, which apparently surpasses the worst that India can offer. Uh, Saudi finds it beyond all doubt that Hinduism is the most diabolical that has ever existed. Um, so uh, rather, rather strange kind of description of Hinduism, but a, a Saudi's problem is that Hinduism is all fables and kind of uh, that's why it is diabolical. Um, in contrast to Saudi, however, there is the famed Oriental scholar, Sir William Jones, whose birth, uh, well, yesterday was the foundation day of the Indian Asiatic Society, uh, which William Jones founded. And uh, Jones is very sympathetic to Hinduism. In in a in letter written, uh, Jones writes to his colleague Charles Wilkins, who translated the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Jones says that I am in love with the Gopia, charmed with Kishan, and and uh, and uh, enthusiastic uh, follower of Ram, uh, uh, and a devout adorer of Brahma. Uh, he writes Brahma, uh, not to mention Yudhishthir, Arjun, Korno and other warriors of the Mahabharat appear greater in my eyes than Agamemnon, Ajax, and Achilles appeared when I first read the Iliad. 
but uh, Jones is not merely the scholar and translator of Sanskrit texts. He also complete, composes poetry on subjects from Indian mythology. A hymn to Surya, which was an influence on many romantic poets, is one of Jones's celebrated works. In fact, in fact, the anthology of romantic poetry recently edited uh, has been in you know, open with kind of Jones's uh, hymn to Surya. As Johnson points out, uh, though, Jones's interest in translation has a distinct colonial purpose. Uh, on the one hand, he aligns himself and his poetic activity with Britain's colonial enterprise in India. On the other hand, he boasts that his understanding of Sanskrit is good enough to allow him unfettered access to the Orient knowledge from its fountain pure. And such access uh, was important within uh, Jones's uh, professional duties, says Johnson. Now, uh, what I want to say is that although uh, Jones, uh, by different means, Jones and Saudi both achieved the same end, the furtherance of empire. In both cases, the Hindu mythology is uh, appropriated within Western frameworks of religion, piety, mythology, and history. Saudi's brilliant uh, you know, and bizarre sp spelling such as Padalon for Patal and Jones's comparisons with the Greek epics are indicative. Uh, these, this brings up a different and much later uh, definition of Orientalism, one that, uh, you know, differs hugely from the way Jones would have justified it. And this uh, definition is what I just described with Edward Said's uh, definitions, as e Edward Said's definition. So Orientalism for, uh, you know, Jones and the Orient of Saudi, they are the same thing in the sense that they're, they're creations of the Western consciousness, uh, wherein they kind of interpret um, kind of in Hindu religion or Buddhism, uh, oriental, so-called oriental religions, Eastern religions. Um, so in a sense, both Saudis and uh, Jones's recasting and translation of Hindu mythology, despite their different purposes, were based on an imaginative reconstruction by a sovereign Western consciousness out of whose unchallenged centrality an oriental world emerged. This is, I'm quoting Said in the last part. Uh, so elsewhere, I've in another article, I've addressed how Far Cry 4 represents South Asian history in the way it recreates its preferred mix of Indic religions in the fictional religion of Kirat. Uh, and, and I say that it is similar to the tradition of European reconstructions of Hinduism in plays such as Kehama, all the way down to Steven Spielberg's notorious portrayal of Hinduism in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, which was banned in India after its release in 1984. And you see, uh, if you, I don't know if you've managed to ever watch Indiana, Doom, Doom, uh, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, where you see kind of uh, uh, Amrish Puri uh, as the priest Molaram, and the Indians are shown as eating, eating monkey brains and uh, enslaving young children and so on and so forth and uh, committing human sac you know, sort of uh, sacrificing humans and so on. So um, I, I see this as, as, as a similar kind of Orientalism, uh, uh, a kind of a construction of the Orient, Far Cry 4, as a similar kind of construction of the Orient as, um, as in uh, you know, Spielberg's Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom. Uh, or going further back into stories like The Curse of Kehama by Robert Saudi or The Hymn to Surya by William Jones, whether they have different purposes, ultimately it is the same end. And this is, this is of course, a uh, painting by Delacroix where uh, you, you're, you're shown like uh, Moorish women uh, in Algiers or more somewhere in Morocco as, as being loose women and in, in the way that they're all part of this kind of harem and uh, uh, or, or they're very kind of easy in, in, to access really that kind of uh, easy, easy to kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, well exploit in that sense. And uh, it's, it's kind of a similar kind of construction of, of, uh, of, uh, of the East as it were, that I, I also see as continuing in Far Cry 4. Now, uh, having said that, the, like I said, the, the developers of Far Cry 4 started by saying that they did not want to do this. They started by saying they did not want to create a Disneyland out of Nepal. But um, uh, as, as kind of uh, Gregory Grieve, uh, a scholar who's recently worked on uh, Nepal and video games, uh, writes, 
he, he describes uh, how Nepal is treated uh, generally uh, in the Western mind as an isolated Shangri-La. Uh, it's supposed as, as, as posed as an underdeveloped tradi traditional nation full of picturesque poverty overdetermined with religious culture and blessed with um, beautiful Himal Himalayan landscapes, reeking with a romantic orientalism uh, and this, uh, of course, and now he comp compares Shangri-La. I don't know if you know about Shangri-La. Many of you have, I'm sure you've stayed in <coughs> hotels called Hotel Shangri-La or eaten at restaurants, eaten momos at restaurants called Shangri-La. But, uh, and uh, until uh, not so long ago, I thought that Shangri-La was a real place. Or at least, at least it was part of uh, of kind of uh, Eastern mythology or Buddhist mythology or something like that. When I until I was a teenager, and uh, or maybe uh, or even in my college days, I thought kind of it was it was. Uh, but then I, I learned that it was absolutely a Western inven invention. There is nothing called Shangri-La in in Buddhist mythology or Buddhist texts. Shangri-La was actually a creation of a person called James Hilton in a novel called Lost Horizon. Right, and uh, and uh, Hilton actually uh, is writing this around the time of the World War, actually, and he he writes this novel where these people end up, this European group of Europeans end up in this uh, mystical valley called Shangri-La, which is this peaceful place, and ultimately what you find is that all the peace in Shangri-La is actually due to. Uh, where you know uh, it's really really kind of uh, peaceful and kind of oriental atmosphere but what gives meaning to the place is that actually there are portuguese monks there so there is a capuchin monk who has found all the way uh, he found his way to shangri-la and you you hear tedium laudamus which is a uh, like the gregorian chant and om mani padme hum being sung equally in the temples of the valley uh, in Far Cry 4, however, Shangri-La is the location of a drug-induced journey. So uh, Far Cry 4 understands that uh, Shangri-La is not a real place, but in uh, instead of kind of making it, uh, you know, uh, it, well, first of all, they have to bring in Shangri-La because they're writing, uh, they're, they're creating this game about Nepal. But uh, uh, you can you can actually access Shangri-La missions by uh, by smoking up. Uh, or, or kind of injecting yourself with drugs, which uh, yo a hippie cup duo, yo Yogi and Reggie, give you, and uh, <clears throat> and here you you kind of come across uh, uh, you you kind of you have to play as Kalinag, this kind of uh, mythical uh, character in Kirat, and you're aided by a white tiger and elephant. And, uh, incidentally, in Far Cry Four, you always see the elephant and the tiger. Uh, and in fact, your power-ups are also connected to ele elephant and tiger. Uh, so very, very typical uh, description of India. Uh, I, I, I remember once when I was in the UK as a student, I was asked uh, whether I rode elephants to work. Uh, but uh, nobody asked me about tigers. Uh, but yeah, I'm sure these are really, really kind of stereotypical things. So you have kind of uh, here, you have the player's objective is to kill a rakshas uh, uh, or a demon in this. Uh, so you, you basically access Shangri-La in the game by getting high. And once you're high, then you're supposed to kill a rakshas. Uh, but uh, of course, in uh, that's also quite contradictory because uh, I mean, uh, how, how, is, uh, how, how is the haven of peace a place where you have to kill a rakshas? But anyway, if we are going with the game, then uh, <coughs> you have, um, uh, well, uh, in the game says that finally, when you uh, when you're in the game, it says it tells you that to believe in something beyond yourself, that is true paradise, Shangri-La. So that's what the game describes Shangri-La as. So after much button mashing violence, the player is able to make Shangri-La the haven of peace again and be its savior. And of course, on waking up, the protagonist found himself uh, sorry finds himself in a house strewn with kind of bottles of whiskey and a large thangka making uh, kind of uh, facing him and other Buddhist symbols such as the endless knot hanging in the background. Obviously the player levels up and gains an additional health bar. So this is the Thangka. Now uh, uh, my student Shorab and I tried to figure out what it says that, that, uh, in the Thangka and we 
just kind of uh, finally gave up. I think this is like a mixture of kind of random words from Sanskrit, which mean nothing really. So uh, this is this is the Shangri-La Thank after you complete the mission, you see yourself as Kali Nag and you see the tiger and the elephant and uh, in this, uh, this absolutely meaningless text that has been put there. So, uh, I mean, uh, Shangri-La is kind of like a Disneyland for for the game developers, I'd say, and me, maybe maybe the entire uh, notion of religion in this game, kind of is is a is a model that one can look at uh, in Disneyland. In fact, I'm not the first to say this uh, because Jay Nivamura also talks about uh, virtual Orientalism uh, in uh, you know in uh, showing in when when she talks about Mahesh Yogi's Rishi Mahesh Yogi who who was the who was like an inspiration for the Beatles, if you remember. So when, when she talks about Rishi Mahesh Yogi's popularity, she's talking about how this is virtual Orientalism. But uh, I mean, I, I want to say that this is, this is like, uh, this whole construction of religion uh, is like the Shangri-La metaphor or, or like, like Shangri-La in the sense, it's like a Disneyland, which, is, uh, which has all these kind of entangled orders of simulation. The Disneyland imaginary is neither true nor false. It is a deterrence. Uh, um, sorry, uh, it's a deterrence machine set up in order to rejuvenate the fiction of the real. This is what this is. Uh, this is what I uh, kind of uh, borrow from Jean Baudrillard. So, um, the developers have found in Manashur a real and yet not real deity for their Kirat, which is a fictitious and yet seemingly real uh, construction. So, uh, you know, uh, Kirat is also neither real nor not real. Likewise, Banashur is also uh, both real and not real, kind of hyper real. And uh, uh, Banashur, on deeper investigation, emerged as a character whose features in many who features in many disparate myths and cannot be fixed um, to any particular geographical location. Likewise, the other deities of Kirat also have some links to Hindu and Buddhist mythology, um, if only in name. Almost all the religious, all of the religious portrayal of Kirat is of things that seem to be connected to Indic religions. That is where the similarities end. So, um, I would just then say that uh, the the reconstruction of the Banashur myth is, and many other you know, elements taken from Hinduism and Buddhism uh, by the developers makes a much deeper and more sweeping point. That of Orientalism itself as a manifestation of the hyperreal. So I'm actually going on to argue that Orientalism itself, which is so characteristically kind of uh, shown in the way the developers have constructed Banashur, uh, that's why I say worshipping Banashur. Maybe I should have put worshipping in quotes here, in scare quotes here. Uh, uh, is that kind of uh, this this construction of Banashur and this construction of this religion, <coughs> this art, this this kind of and the construction of of this uh, of this area, really, which is both real and not real, uh, is actually making a sweeping point because. They, they're actually wanting to seek a see Nepal exactly as they want to see it, which is why they don't even give it its name. Likewise, they want to see the religion and whatever they connect to it as, as they want to see it, which is why Banashur and Kira. And then my sweeping point is that, uh, that kind of, uh, in this Orientalism then what happens is Orientalism itself becomes a manifestation of the hyperreal. So perhaps what Saudi and uh, William Jones were also doing were actually creating a Disneyland out of the Orient. So, well, this not only complicates issues for religious studies and post-colonial studies, but also necessitates a rethinking of Orientalism in terms of the hyperreal. Um, thank you. So that's me done. I think, yeah, there, there is- Thank you so much, Shobita, for the wonderful let me switch on my camera. Yeah, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It was very insightful and I'm sure we all learned a lot. Because um, the thing about Shangri-La was super interesting to me because I, like you, I, I still used to think 
that it is a legitimate place we used to in hyderabad there are a lot of um, there is one chowmein place that's yes. named shangri la and they have uh, northeastern and nepali uh, stuff so this the way it's advertised shangri la it's, it's advertised as a real place yeah i mean uh, it was a solid shock for me as well ishan because i really thought that shangri la was kind of you know even when i go to bhutan or sikkim you see there all these places called shangri la and you just take it for granted that there is this real kind of you know but shangri la is as real as tintin uh, really <laughs> it is tibet i think so uh, and um, again kind of uh, uh, this fascinating part is that when when the this group of europeans they end up in shangri la again in a plane crash or some, something like that uh, they they hear gregorian chant being kind of sung there uh, so bizarre really and uh, i think there's also a lot of this orientalism which comes in even in 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 bengali literature uh, like in professor shonku's akshingo obijan this kind of like a shangri la like kind of territory area so we often kind of can be um, criticized of uh, of reproducing these oriental stereotypes uh, mm -hmm. stereotypes of you know orientalism yeah um all right so if anyone has any questions i think some of the questions are already in the already in the chat box but you can if you want to if anyone wants to ask a question raise your hand or just put a Uh, comment or question in the chat box feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question but first of all we have ishan's comment he says he watched that it was rather unsettling even though he didn't uh, that was about uh, that was about indiana jones yeah good i'm glad you explained that uh, hiranya has a point he says uh, he asks shangrila is shangrila derived from shambala from probably the probably from this tradition Pro probably from from shambala Uh, but uh, there is nothing called shangri la in buddhism but there is again shambala so maybe maybe that's where hilton got his kind of uh, was inspired uh, to uh, draw so interesting does anyone have any questions you can unmute yourself and ask also maybe we should uh, put up the part about our whatsapp group and uh... oh yes rico could you uh, do that rico or zaira for any of the co-hosts we do have uh, the standard text somewhere yes let me in that uh, while that is happening in the background let me tell you all about our social media channels we have facebook we have facebook group we have a wonderful whatsapp community where we are super active we discuss games we discuss game studies texts we discuss everything that you know can be discussed under the umbrella of uh, game studies yes zenia please feel free Mm. Okay, thanks so much for this um, very intriguing talk with a super theme. I was really looking forward because I missed the AR talk where you you gave something similar. Yes. I have a number of things. Being a, a scholar based in religious study and especially the study of Hindu traditions as well and the video games, so that combination. <laughs> um, you were commenting on a certain point that i believe you said you are not sure why ubisoft uh, picked uh, banashur as uh, the like predominant deity or whatever in the game and i was wondering if you thought along the lines of this a uh, controversy and criticism which certain video games got especially in the earlier phases when uh, hindu deities more prominent hindu deities were included and uh, that might be a point that ubisoft actually like learned from this past and decided to precisely uh, include a deity which is not prominent and not very well known as to avoid criticism from certain hindu groups I don't think Banashur is a Hindu deity at all, uh, but uh, he's an Asur who's worshipped, but very, very kind of un, uh, rather, rather not very common, uh, really, to worship. Um, like even Mah Mahishasur is also worshipped by certain communities, but it's not common really. But uh, yes, yes. Uh, and the other, the thing is that um, uh, I mean, instead of making up a deity uh, or instead of kind of making up a fictional place, they choose to. bring this particular so there there is there is this mix of i think research as well as this mix of fiction uh, and uh, and 
um, my my point is not entirely just about you know just uh, about kind of banashur as the main deity uh, if if they had shown banashur uh, as the main deity and stuck to some of the kind of you know uh, religious traditions instead of creating a mishmash which um, which they i think they did it uh, quite kind of consciously the creation of the mishmash and uh, i look at it um, in terms of orientalism because uh, this is exactly how robert saudi also creates and recreates hinduism and uh, william jones and others like i mentioned and um, all the way down to steven spielberg because uh, they take uh, certain things and then they leave out uh, certain others and in in this case of course there's a fusion and if you have played this game you will see how critical they are of the um, kumari puja tradition of nepal and uh, how they take different kind of i mean it's unmistakable some of the locations are i mean i've actually been to these locations uh, and it's it's unmistakable how that they you know how they've kind of borrowed um, from these traditions but they have also left out quite a bit and this is that leaving out and the reconstruction that my um, that my kind of paper addresses i i'm kind of i i do uh, i have i have read your work on uh, how hanuman boy warrior suffered and um, uh, sony had to kind of be a little more con- uh, also there was this uh, anime series uh, which which also had to be uh, shot in japan uh, but uh, in your paper you refer to uh, the uh, kind of activist uh, or whatever you call him rajan z who who is actually based outside of india and uh, he's uh, he says some really random things but, uh, but uh, uh, i mean z did not even get uh, much kind of mileage or much uh, support people didn't even know about what he was saying here as much in india uh, but but kind of uh, i i still take your point that it is it is always a problem because with the anime series of course there were many other groups uh, many more uh, kind of in you know sort of uh, prominent groups which objected how could you play with a god or how could you create a, a character um, based on a god and so on uh, but i think uh, i think the particular way ubisoft makes this uh, this uh, uh, local kira kirat and it kind of brings in banasur uh, and kira and this whole kind of like imagined religion um uh, i think it's it's more orientalist than kind of just responding to kind of concerns where in uh, where you know uh, like also for example fallout 3 did not get released in india because it portrayed um, the oh. uh, portrayed mutant cattle and called them Bra- uh, brahmin uh, which uh, uh, therefore microsoft thought was kind of uh, you know un or unsafe to release in india or insulting to cultural influences i can understand all of that but i think this this construction in in this particular case really to set the uh, and this is what far cry games usually do they're doing it very uh, quite a lot with cuba in far cry 6 as my uh, friend felix uh, you know uh, phil uh, pinix tatson has commented recently uh, so uh, there this this construction of kind of uh, i think nepal stroke kirat is like a disneyland hyper real kind of uh, construction and therefore i kind of liken it with orientalism uh, that's that's my reading of it i i think I, that's a very clever reading by the way and uh, the thing is also uh, you made that very strong that point in your talk and you were asking for comments how to develop a paper possibly and so on i think this is a um, this is a very valid and and a super um, also timely way to to go with this paper to actually argument i would do that at least that orientalism is something which is so strongly um, um embedded in even the little you called it research i would put that in <laughs> in somehow in a, i would relativate that because of course ubisoft would have done some research but then also i agree to what you said before that i'm pretty sure they very consciously made this mishmash and picked the bits and pieces which they thought might be appealing to especially a western audience with with no background knowledge about both religious traditions probably or very little and to make it colorful and 
Orientalist, right, that's the point. But then I doubt that this Orientalism historical uh, background and the whole debate around the academic debate around uh, uh, Orientalism would be known or thought of as relevant by the Ubisoft developers. So of course, another way to go would be to actually try to interview two or three of these uh, game developers from Ubisoft. I know it's difficult to get access to them, but in the very end, you sent something which, has, which I thought of as right. That's the point. It's the construction. It's the construction of, and then you said of what they want to perceive or see as Nepal or Hindu traditions. But that at this point is only a claim. I would be very careful. So, uh, you can say that's so a theory I, I, I will have to and develop so on, this but they didn't interview the person. So that would be tricky. I would yeah, some, someone else has actually. I mean, if you read the full paper, which is actually now, uh, I, I, uh, is, they, they have actually also made three documentaries. And they have also been interviewed. Um, you know, where where they have talked about the, how the fact that they did not want to portray uh, Nepal as uh, Disneyland, and there is a there is yeah. a, also an article in the Escapist magazine, which they have uh, where they have been interviewed. And uh, I mean, uh, the, if you if you look if you play Far Cry Three, then you will see that you can fly ultralight aircraft. You have like these uh, mountain jeeps and things like that. All of these things are there in Nepal. And uh, uh, and the whole story is also somehow kind of tied into the Maoist uh, kind of um, struggle in Nepal as well. And they have interviewed some of the which I which which part I have not looked at at all in this paper, which I have talked about in my earlier paper in games and culture, but uh, which where they have actually talked about Maoism and they've talked to, talked to kind of former Maoist uh, well uh, fighters both men and women, they've walked around the Maoist trail. So they've done all of that. And they have also given copious interviews. So it seems like they have, uh, you know, they wanted to talk about this from the very beginning. And uh, like I mentioned, Jane Yuamura's uh, work on Mahesh Yogi is quite, uh, it resonates quite a lot with my, my paper here. <coughs> I have not, I've been unwell recently, so I have not been able to, uh, you know, uh, so that into this presentation, but I really wanted to. But I think it's also important to, uh, like you say, to also touch on the fact or also address the fact that uh, that there was this, you know, there was this kind of protest against portraying Indian gods in in kind of video games, and uh, maybe uh, maybe Ubisoft could have, you know, responded in this way. And uh, to uh, basically to actually answer your question when I you know lay out the argument of the paper, but I still go with uh, this thing that Ubisoft may not have known. Ubisoft developers may not have known about Robert Saudi, or may not even have watched <coughs> Indiana Jones or may not have read uh, James Hilton's Shangri-La, but uh, the general sentiment carries through really. This is the, exactly what I was saying. Exactly. Yes. Without, without kind of, you know, knowing all this. So, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Thank you, Zinia. Yeah. Thanks a lot. I have one more point, if I may, a small yes. one. <laughs> it's just another like word of caution. If I think about papers, when you develop a full paper about that, I think you very, of course, you were totally right when you said the Orient is a creation. Yes. But then we have to be aware, so is the Hinduism. I think we have to be more precise when speaking about Hindu mythology you actually you have to reference precisely i would expect that and i'm sure you'll do it in your paper just mentioning it you have to say exactly which text in fact you have to dig out the shloka and say there and there you can look it up and it's not even enough to say in puranic mythology because again yes banashur and other figures are so not so well known that people might not know even the like experts or whatever people who know Quranic texts a lot. So, so, so I would like to see that proper references for the um, proper textual background in case there is any. I, there, there, so much there is, um, there is a, a kind of, um, of course, uh, there are references and I've, I've kind of like, I was reading out from the paper initially, but then I stopped 
but uh, yes, there are uh, references uh, to Banashur in a couple of Purans, really, and um, those I have already referenced in that uh, in, in the paper. Uh, and there are also kind of, of course, uh, one of the things that I could add is perhaps oral history for which then one would need to travel a bit, which is difficult under these times, but to go to the temples of, of Banashur or uh, the areas where, you know, these things are kind of, you know, and then kind of interview people uh, and talk to them about kind of uh, what, what they perceive really. So uh, that's that's something that is a question mark that needs to be done. But yes, of course, of course, to uh, the Puran, Puranas, really, uh, where, which uh, I need to definitely mention. And like I mentioned, in one, one of the stories is in the Bhagavad Purana, but there is also another mention of the story. And since this is connected to the Mahabharata and all of that as well, but there's also a mention of Banashur in the Mahabharata, by the way. So, uh, yeah, so maybe ed editions and shlokas and all of these. Yes. So thanks again, Sinia. I'll do that. I'll definitely look at these sources and cite them. And certainly, I'm sure uh, we all believe here there is no one Hinduism. And it's like, a, well, so that's also important to highlight that in the paper itself. Uh, Zahra has commented that Hilton had vaguely said he had read an ancient travelogue when he uh, when he was asked about his source. Yes, uh, so I I think again to kind of um, what made him think of this, I have no idea to be honest, and um, I do need plan to read up more on James Hilton, such an interesting character to uh, totally invent something that and then sell it to us all of us bought it so uh, you can imagine uh, how people in the west also would kind of you know buy uh, this notion of shangri-la because at least we believe in shangri-la when we have our chowmin but uh, he i think he uh, don't comment um, regarding shambhala is kind of i think uh, he uh, he's probably got some of it from there really but um, I, I'll have to I have to go back to uh, you know researching Hilton as well when I talk a little uh, talk more about uh, actually Gregory Grieve has has actually done the research and I can also piggyback on his work uh, but uh, but I also certainly need to need to look up the references. I'm actually uh, grateful to Xenia for uh, directing me to Gregory Grieve's article. Uh, which and then I found another article by him and uh, uh, where he started to make these connections and uh, well I'll certainly I'll certainly look up uh, more on Hilton and uh, and get back to you Zara once I figure out why he did what he did <laughs> yeah all right uh, looks like we don't have any questions anymore in the chat box at least anyone else if you have any questions feel free to unmute yourself you can also compliment slash comment there is a question in the chat box uh, oh yeah it just came in um yeah okay. it's a long one Abhi, be... would you like to uh, unmute yourself and ask or shovika is reading so I'm actually reading it uh, uh, quite uh, silently, but if you want to, uh, you know, read out. Okay, so he's having trouble with the mic. No worries. I'm wondering at what point do we draw the line between a reductive adaptation of a culture and a reflective one? No, well, no, it's a very difficult uh, thing to answer. Uh, the presumption of an impose, imposed infidelity to the source might be myopic in some cases. It is not as if a na native lens has more validity than outsiders if they are not on the same platform. The insider native does not look at his culture from the perspective of study and scrutiny, but the outsider will inevitably do. How do you call the former more truthful? Is it experience? And experience itself is always steeped in bias. Okay. So no, I don't uh, say that uh, my experience is more truthful than that of the Ubisoft developers or somebody who, is, who lives in Nepal, the, the experience is more truthful. Uh, 
and not kind of claiming a higher truth in that sense. But what I'm saying is that the construction of uh, of Nepal, 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 as you pronounce it, and Nepal in Ubisoft, uh, uh, Far Cry 4, or the construction of South Asian religion as or in as a mishmash like they've done is is an orientalist uh, kind of construction now if you think that uh, william jones's hymn to surya is more true to surya as you perceive it uh, absolutely you're totally valid to think about it i mean if you want to read uh, the mahabharat in uh, or the rather the bhagavad gita in charles wilkins translation fantastic i mean why not uh, i mean and many of us don't have sanskrit anyway so you, know, you might think that that's uh, so i'm not kind of uh, uh, saying that um, that the outsiders uh, who is the outsider first of all i mean uh, there was a major general called general charles hindu stewart who uh, who in everything believed he was hindu and he was he would go and bathe in the ganges and go to the Kumbh Mela and Ganga Shagar Mela and things like that. So, and if you go to the South Park Cemetery in Kolkata, his his uh, tomb is shaped like a temple. So I'm not kind of saying, uh, or or if you've read William Dalrymple's White, The White Mughal, if you look at James Achilles Kirkpatrick. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, that the outsider or the insider uh, kind of that thing that that notion of experience really is coming in here. What I'm saying is that. Uh, that both Jones and Saadi are constructing uh, uh, Hinduism in a certain way, and that that even today, uh, uh, down to Spielberg or down to a video game like Far Cry 4, that's being kind of uh, reflected. And uh, there is a colonial uh, kind of dimension to it. I'm sure uh, whether you uh, question the truth of, I mean, whether you uh, call it experience or whatever, Colonialism ex has existed, right? And there is a level of exploitation. There is a level of uh, construction of of uh, truth using using the colonial bias uh, and using kind of the power relationships there, and that's what I think is being reproduced here. Uh, so, mm, I mean, uh, of course, truth is uh, it, it, as far as I'm concerned, it 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 depends on how you perceive it. But uh, I, I, see the, I see the construction in, in kind of um, Far Cry 4 as a colonial construction, as an orientalist construction, as a repeat a repetition of what has been going on in the construction of uh, the Orient. In the sense, of course, you might, you might just say that Sa Saeed was uh, pretty much dreaming it all up. And after all, uh, hey, come on, the Orient, well, uh, it is it is kind of as uh, as 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 fictional really uh, created by the you know e even if an Indian talks about India that is also as fictional as uh, as kind of even if William Jones talks about Hinduism uh, uh, that's a, that that's that's kind of I'm sure a position you're most willing you know you know most uh, uh, sort of allowed to take but. Um, my issue is about kind of orientalism and and how kind of it uh, continues so uh, i think ubisoft just continues that lens uh, uh, you know doing a value judgment is not my uh, kind of not my intention if it came out like that but uh, it's certainly kind of uh, i think it's a carryover from uh, from kind of yeah from uh, from back in the days like i mean robert saudi was thinking that uh, the way he saw hinduism was right and uh, i'm sure somebody who is uh, sitting here and uh, looking at hinduism in a certain way might think it's right and so it's important like zinia said that there are so many hinduisms uh, and so many ways of looking at it um, as i should have earlier mentioned but my my main premise was to uh, show the Shall I just use a new media term, remediation of Orientalism, right? Creating, uh, you know, re recreating Orientalism in this new media. Yep. That is a great term, actually. I'm just keep noting it down. <laughs> yeah, but I, I've actually, I actually kind of argued that Orientalism is, is like uh, hyper real. Is uh, I mean, both yeah. are probably 
but uh, I mean, I thought it was very new, but like I was telling you, Poonam, that it's always risky to think that uh, things are new because uh, at this colloquium we had at the American Academy of Religion, or uh, Jay Nivamura just told me very, very quietly that she had also written about something similar with Mahesh Yogi. So, yeah, that's right. So, right, so there's another question. Shall I take this one, Poonam? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. Roman, do you want me to, want to ask me? Or, you can uh, unmute yourself if you want. Oh, uh, is my mic audible? Because I have yeah, yeah. it's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll just read out my question because um, I don't want yeah, to. Uh, so we expect big companies to bring reflective representations of objects slash artifacts beyond the West and allow, allow and then at the same time we allow them to get away with shallow and orientalist representations. And at the same time as consumers, we also give into buying games. Uh, I mean, I think like this is kind of like the mindset between a few of my Indian gamer friends. Uh, even if you see a game that has, that mentions India or represents India in some way, that becomes an object you want to buy just because, okay, my country is being represented in a uh, game I like, or games is a thing that I like in general. So, I mean, I know right now in some way, like when you uh, talked about the history and how, how Far Cry 4 is representing a certain part of culture, India, Nepal, and a lot of other things. And we can see how it's shallow as well, but, in that, in that sense, we are complaining about it, right? We are complaining that, okay, like this is not the representation we want, especially from a AAA company like Ubisoft, which has enough resources to do its research and get a product out. Uh, so, I mean, is the most we can do is like complain about it or is there something more to it? I think Xenia has answered my question already, but I'll, uh, I'll kind of- I'm so sorry, I didn't want it. <laughs> But it's so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, so I, I'm just going to take this discussion entirely away from video games and go to UTT, right? Most of us watch Netflix nowadays. Uh, and uh, there's a TV serial called Beecham House on Netflix. Uh, shows India in the time of Shah Alam and uh, you know, all the trappings of kind of Mughal uh, grander, but of course, Shah Alam is an empire emperor who is to be saved, and uh, all the Indian women are to be saved. And who's going to save them is a white man, not a white woman, mind you. The white woman also has to be saved, but it's always the white man who has to save them, right? So this white savior, but white white man kind of saving um, the world. That's that's been the narrative of colonial kind of narrative, um, and not just colonial. I mean, white man white men saving white women. Uh, also another thing, I mean, I, I'm reminded of Tarzan when, when she already also kind of jumps from branch to branch in the wild wild wilderness of Africa and saves Jane and other damsels in distress, uh, all of that. That's uh, that's there. It's, it's very gendered. It's very kind of, uh, well, it's very uh, kind of uh, uh, also kind of... Uh, in a, in, a, in, a, in a way racist as well but and also this notion of empowerment and that's it's it's, it's there it's kind of, it goes through you know it it's it's there in the in the narrative and that's that's what sells pretty much for for a wider audience now of course there are ways to critique this to to counter these there are counter narratives that get them but we get them uh, in ways that are very few and far between uh, because uh also also with uh ubisoft in and uh, you know is notorious for the doing these things to be honest i mean you say that why big co uh, why companies like ubisoft do this ubisoft does this with all the kind of or most of its kind of uh, franchises and um, to get the get the you know sort of uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's perhaps more appealing. Now, why it is more appealing, why Orientalism is more appealing, why, why you would like the uh, white man rescuing the woman or whatever. Uh, this, this is, of course, kind of a longer and uh, bigger issue. Uh, but 
it's it's happens in in um, in uh, all, and that's what I'm saying that it's kind of a remediation because it's happening in video games. It's not a new thing really. Um, I'm just showing one. But I just wanted to take on this aspect of religion because most people don't even know what who Banashur is or what Kirat is, and uh, ev even though we are uh, we are so close to the lo location of of this game. And in some ways, we are also culturally connected to it in some ways, uh, but we don't ha you know, have the wherewithal to question, which is why I wanted to raise these issues. But this is, this is not, I'm not saying anything new, really, Rohan. I mean, this is, this is just kind of uh, goes on and on, and we need to be aware of this, to consider this, and to, and to critique this. And also, perhaps at, uh, um, in, in kind of, uh, at some levels, game designers such as yourself, maybe uh, think of think of making other games like uh, for example dhruv jani has done with his somewhere series uh, 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 or or making different games which kind of uh, have a different logic altogether right uh, instead of a, instead of a logic of empire of colonialism of exploitation all of that so that's uh, that's my take on it now first of all uh, I, I mean or, you know, until and unless people kind of like realize that these issues uh, or get sensitized to these issues, they would not be making these games, right? So uh, perhaps perhaps that's, uh, that's one of the purposes of such research in game studies. Um, but no, it's not my, my paper is not a complaint, really. It's just kind of pointing out something as it is. Now, uh, for some people, it might be a good thing to have an Orientalist remediation. I mean, some people really enjoyed watching Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I know that Satyajit Ray didn't, he hated it. But, uh, and he was like, uh, quite, uh, he found out lots of kind of um, problems with it, uh, if you read his interviews. But there are some people who really liked it. Amrish Puri himself, he, well, it was controversial, the fact that he actually chose to act in it. He said he didn't approve of it, but he just he he got the money. He acted in it, and uh, and well, it got got him like a chance to work with Steven Spielberg and so on. So, yeah. So, right. Uh, I mean, uh, but it's important for us to realize. I think. I mean, my part is to realize that this this is ongoing. This is an ongoing tradition, even in games. Games don't kind of, um, they're not kind of divorced from everything else happening in other cultures. So, well, there we go. So, yeah, so I think, I think uh, such, such research and such kind of commentary is necessary, not just for games. You, we are here because this is Degra India, we're talking about games, but it's necessary for uh, all the things that we are watching. When you're watching Netflix, when you're watching kind of like uh, stuff on social media, then do do think critically, and then once you think critically, you can also respond critically. You can also make games which are critical. If I could make games, I would certainly make something which would uh, kind of uh, criticize such kind of issues. You can, so up to you. Okay. So there you go. Are you raising your hand, Rohan? Oh uh, yeah, I have a yeah. follow up. Uh, I get I get the direction you are like trying to get at. Uh, I mean, the first episode make try and make conversation about it, right? And I've worked in the Indian gaming industry, uh, and like, so I have a limited experience in the gaming industry. But the places I've worked with and the people I've worked with, right? Uh, it's very difficult to get this conversation there. Uh, not only because, like, what kind of difficult backgrounds everyone comes from uh, in the gaming industry. And I don't think people give a lot of time. They don't wanna give a lot of time to like researching or getting the right narrative out there. In the end, it's about getting a game out there somehow or the other way, right? And there is this one particular example, uh, right now hyper casual games is blowing up, right? And India is like one of the big places where big companies are coming and outsourcing to small Indian game developers because that's some potential money you can have, uh, which is like a constant source of income. And the kind of games, we sexualize characters. The, we get, literally we get uh, scripts and color palettes and the design patterns 
which work with cello on CPI, uh, Facebook CPI ads, and characters are sexualized, this, that. And I mean, like, there's one level at which I give a sh shit about, like, how much ethical regulation is happening here. And even big companies like Quali, they probably have some regulations happen, right? But even the people working I'm working with, they don't care. They, they, la make, they laugh about it. So, I mean, there's a lot of things that need to change, right? But I don't know if, like, at a research level, how do we get it to the ground level? Yes, I don't absolutely. know. So Absolutely. So this, this bridge between the industry and research is something that needs to be uh, kind of thought through. And uh, the fact that a game developer or somebody who's worked in game development, such as you have, is now looking at thinking about this is a good start. And I would say, um, I'm going to again uh, bring Zinia to my rescue here, uh, which is that uh, if you look at a game that she has made uh, with uh, Satyajit, uh, I was about to say Ray, sorry, Satyajit Chakravarti, uh, uh, who, uh, which is actually a very thoughtful uh, way of representing culture. Uh, and of course here, the outside inside thing also comes in who is outside, who is inside. I mean, uh, it's not, uh, but then again, the thing is that, uh, you know, uh, perhaps, perhaps making, making games which think of uh, in culture and, and or make us, make us uh, consider culture and kind of think in different ways uh, is, is a way forward. And uh, I'm, I'm not all doom and gloom about this. Although, to be honest with you, I've like uh, had, when I when I once uh, used to judge um, uh, uh, like for games for uh, certain kind of uh, game events in India, then I would get like so many clones of Angry Birds um, made like Chota Bheem or something or something like that. Like instead of instead of the birds, there were little Chota Bheems or other kind of. So uh, it, it it was quite um, upsetting. And there's also this whole trend towards monetizing, which is geared, as someone said, is a matter of which sells in the West and that kind of thing. But it's not it's not always like that, you know, and the things are changing. And uh, as more and more discussions like this kind of grow uh, and they become louder, I think, uh, you know, uh, I think that there might be an improvement. But the other, uh, other uh, extreme angle is that, uh, is the other extreme angle, which I don't want to spell out, but uh, uh, like uh, everything uh, that is made here is great or something like that. But uh, I don't want to spell that out very much. But it's there, I think I think we need to you know, talk more with the industry. And I we actually have an under planned with some of the industry uh, people Actually, Yadu Rajiv has uh, uh, also uh, broached the idea uh, to me. So we will have an Adda uh, in not so uh, far off days to come where we can all kind of uh, bring our opinions to the developers and the developers talk to us. So let's see. So, yeah. I hope that answers your question, Rohan. Yes, and um, like Shobik, Shobik sir said that the link between the academy and uh, academics and the industry is super important. This reminds me of a very different um, thing that happened. I'm not sure if everybody is familiar with the series called Emily in Paris. And in the first season, it, the, the idea of France was heavily romanticized and very kind of fetishized, in fact. And it got a lot of flack on YouTube, especially on Twitter and everywhere. And it had an impact. And that is what was very impressive to me. So the second season when it came out, it, they had corrected a lot of issues. They had, it still has a lot of problems, but a lot of problems were fixed. So I, when I criticize something, I hope that it gets seen, it gets read. And so I think all of us have that um, idea in mind that it gets read and somebody will take note and somebody will change the ways moving forward. Yeah, I mean, so that's just the hope. I, th I think that's a very nice kind of uh, uh, comment, really, Poonam, because there's also Occidentalism as well as Orientalism. And there are also, uh, and remember, Paris is east, east to America. <laughs> but, uh, but this construction of Paris as, as particular as something. Uh, also, uh, I haven't watched the series. I, uh, it's on my 
list now, but uh, I think I think that it's this whole idea that you know uh, France is like this and Paris mm. is like that's also another kind of uh, I mean these even, stereotypes. Yeah, even uh, Carrie Bradshaw's new series, uh, it, the, the 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 with the reboot of um, Sex and the City, it's now called And Just Like That. It had a bit where. Uh, Carrie Bradshaw has an Indian friend and she takes her to a so-called sari shop, which is actually a lehenga shop. And they keep saying sari, 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 but they're talking about a lehenga. And then she goes to a Diwali party wearing a lehenga, but then it gets called a sari. And it's so, and again, it got a lot of flack on Twitter and it got talked about a lot. Bring so it back I'm to hoping games. that it changes. Didn't you tell me about something in Spirit Fairer, which is an Indian uh, food? Oh, uh, oh yes, Alu Gobi. Oh my God, yeah. yes, Alu Gobi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was um, the Gobi Alu, uh, the dish. Yes, uh, and there were only two ingredients. Yes, it was described as a uh, as a salad. Yes, it was described described as a salad, not even as a grilled vegetable. They put it under salad. It was so bizarre. Yeah, I took well, a screenshot uh, and sent it to Spirit Fairer people. I, ho I, I hope, hope nobody tries to eat alu gobi salad today. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, we have. Yeah. <laughs> and the recipe ingredients are just potatoes and some spicy sort of this firecracker kind of an element, which does not make sense because alu gobi needs gobi. You need cauliflower for that. But there's no mention of cauliflower. It's just some spicy thing. And it was it was interesting. Yeah. Well. No, no, fire, <laughs> firecrackers. Cool. Anyway, I hope that all of our questions have been answered and everybody had a good time today discussing the very important topics. And with that, I think we're going to take leave. Thank you very much, Punam. And thank you, Shobhik, a lot. For, for thank you, Zinia. Thank you, everybody, for the great questions. Yeah, yeah. Yes, and thank you, Shobhik, a lot for doing this talk despite your um, health despite the difficult times that we're all going through. Well, so. uh, hopefully, hopefully it'll be better. We'll be back for better kind of times, uh, you know, in February in, uh, we have Matthias uh, delivering his talk. So thanks a lot. <laughs>